Uh, thank you very much. Uh, next slide, please. So I'm going to talk about lung disease, but I wanted to sort of uh, start off with some of the emerging therapies that are that are out there. And then um, I'm going to talk about specifically a couple of select lung disease uh, therapies, uh, and Pavel's going to talk about the liver disease as well. So um, there's never been a time in the history of alpha-1 treatment deficiency where there have been so many potential therapies on the horizon. Uh, I'd like to think of them in different categories. There are gene-based therapeutics, including CRISPR, Cas9, uh, uh, ADAR, um, uh, uh, AAV gene therapy, RNAi, and, and probably some that I haven't thought of from that standpoint. There are some stem cell therapy therapies that are being uh, looked at from that standpoint. There are a couple of three companies that are looking at small molecule uh, correctors analogous to the cystic fibrosis story. There are some very good elastase inhibitors that are in clinical trials right now. There's common alpha-1 trypsin like molecules that, that uh, are in clinical trials like right now. There are several clinical trials looking at different doses of uh, plasma alpha-1 trypsin out there. And there are different routes of administration of plasma alpha-1 trypsin, including subcutaneously and inhaled. Next slide. So I'm going to begin with this two select. Uh, categories to, to focus in on uh, uh, that there have been active clinical trials. The first one is the Inhibrix 101 study, which is a recombinant alpha trypsin FC fusion protein. The theoretical involved, uh, 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 advantage of this particular recombinant alpha trypsin that it has two alpha trypsin molecules and is bound to an FC fragment, which basically prolongs the plasma half-life. Now, let's talk first about standard alpha uh, antitrypsin replacement therapy, and this is an example of that from that standpoint. Typically, that therapy is given once weekly. You have fairly high um, peaks with the, uh, on day one of mission where it tapers off uh, uh, to, to uh, about the, what was thought to be the, the, uh, the, the protective range for alpha trypsin. And over time, what happens is that as you get it for more than uh, six weeks, is the levels sort of go into well above the normal, the, the cutoff range that we think from that standpoint. Next slide. In the Inhibrix 101 phase one study, which is uh, nearly finished at the present time, and uh, is that basically they were two components to it. One was a single uh, escalating dose using uh, 10, 40, 80, and 120 milligrams per, per, per uh, treatment. And it's a single dose. And then a multiple ascending uh, uh, dose escalation using 40, 80, and 120 milligrams per uh, dose from that standpoint. Let's go in and just briefly look at some of the, the outcomes from that. But that uh, have been released in press reports. Next slide. And so some of the preliminary PK data from, from these studies have shown that the, the half-life is actually quite long uh, it, it, with the, the FC fragment attached to it, indeed moving out to close to uh, three weeks uh, in, in that. And, and, Based on uh, on pharmacokinetic predictions, it looks like 120 milligrams uh, of uh, inhibrix 101 could be given IV once uh, once every three weeks, which would be you know obviously a, a time savings for alpha one patients if they only got an infusion once every three weeks from that standpoint. Next slide. So it's very, I mean, that, that, that recombinant molecule capitalizes on a lot of science, including the use of FC fragments to extend the half-life uh, of alpha and trypsin. And uh, it's a very promising, and it looks like we'll, they'll be going into phase two, three studies very soon in that particular, uh, that particular drug as well. The second study I want to talk about is something that's been around for a long time that we talked about, uh, and, and that is inhaled alpha-1 trypsin. The example that I'm going to present here is the phase two study of Comata uh, uh, alpha-1 trypsin inhalation. In that study, there were 36 patients with alpha-1 trypsin. They were given two different doses, one 80 milligrams a day, and one was 160 milligrams per, uh, per day. Uh, those are, the 160 was broken up into two inhalations. Each group was randomized uh, on a two to one basis from that standpoint. 
and uh, each group uh, and their matching placebo were enrolled in separate studies. Next slide. So the primary outcome variables were levels of antigenic and functional alpha-natrypsin and the epithelial lining fluid. This is more of a broncholabilavage st study to show whether uh, the, there were sufficient levels of alpha-natrypsin. And there are a number of secondary outpoint, uh, 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 consequences as well, including looking at neutrophil elastase concentration. Uh, theoretically, uh, as considering alpha chips as a natural anti-inflammatory molecule, if you were to treat people that had an, an excess amount of neutrophil elastase and neutrophils, a good therapy would be shown to, to decrease that, and that would be considered basically a biomarker from that standpoint. Next slide, please. So looking at the, the uh, lung level uh, uh, in, in at the 80 milligrams once daily uh, with the epithelial lining fluid normal level being around uh, 2,200 micromolar. You can see in baseline, it's about 300 micromolar in, in a normal alpha one chip deficient individual. But within 12 weeks, uh, the levels are about 17 times higher than baseline at 80 milligrams. Next slide. Again, looking at the lung at, at the 160 milligrams uh, daily, that's again a dose of 80 milligrams twice a day from that standpoint, the levels are even higher. Uh, the baseline still is around 300 micromolar from that standpoint, because of scale, you can't really see it. But uh, uh, those levels uh, uh, could approach more than 20,000 uh, uh, micro, uh, micrograms of of, uh, uh, excuse me, nanomolar of alpha atrips in the lower respiratory tract. So getting up to 100 times higher than baseline from that standpoint. Next slide. But I think one of the important things in this, this study and other studies as we think about biomarkers and showing whether these are logical therapies, that one of the most impressive things is to see that the lung levels of neutrophil elastase uh, actually decreased over a period of 12 weeks from that standpoint, indicating that there was an anti-inflammatory effect that actually decreased the amount of neutrophil elastase over a period of time. That's obviously important, but the most important thing uh, following this is basically show that uh, lung damage slowed over time from that standpoint. Next slide. And we still saw similar uh, effects also with 160 milligrams uh, daily as well with a significant decrease in neutrophil elastase from that standpoint. Next slide. So I'd like to pause for a minute and then sort of reflect on this good news data that we have so many things going in. We still have a number of challenges with new lung disease therapies from that standpoint. And they include better outcome variables uh, including CT scan, blood-based biomarkers. The reason why we need these better outcome variables is because currently using physiology as our primary outcome variable, the sample sizes required and the time that it takes to prove these therapies are actually beneficial are quite long from that standpoint. Um, we need adaptive study designs that don't require placebo, particularly in the context, at least in the United States, where we have generally therapy available. It's hard to convince patients to abandon their therapy that they believe is helping them and go for a placebo for as long as three years using a physiologic outcome. And then finally, and a message to the patient community and everything, is we need alpha one chips and deficient individuals willing to participate in clinical trials. Thank you very much. Uh, well, I'll turn it over to you. Perfect. Thanks a lot. So I will ask uh, uh, to turn on my presentation, I guess. Thanks a lot. Uh, I can only agree with Mark that uh, there has been uh, never such an exciting time as it is now. Uh, next slide. So these are my uh, disclosures. Next slide. So uh, at the beginning, I just wanted to remind everybody that you really have this two in one diseases and that um, the liver uh, is the is a gain of function toxicity. That means we have a retention of misfolded protein that is potentially making uh, the disease and that will also be reflected in the Therapies, which I will, I will discuss. Uh, next slide. 
So this is just a funny slide, I think, to show that we really, that Alpha Y1 pipeline is uh, so interesting that it uh, appears on pretty well-known uh, websites and you don't even need to uh, kind of dig deep. You just can basically take it from the tablo tabloids. Next. So uh, the therapy, which now has the more, uh, highest momentum in the liver disease is the siRNA therapy. Next slide. Uh, so you can uh, move on one more. So uh, the siRNA therapy takes advantage of the fact that uh, alpha-1 antitrypsin is a, is a gain of function disease. So the uh, the alpha one is a toxic uh, component in this context. You can go on, and obviously the buildup of this protein uh, leads to leads to uh, problems, especially if it's not properly degraded. Next slide. You can move on. And uh, this is what the siRNA does. Uh, one back, please. So siRNA is a is a compound which uh, which uh, in this case is specifically targeted to the liver, so so works only in the liver, and blocks the production of uh, of this protein, and and due to that it should uh, stop all the gain of fu uh, function problems. Next slide. Next slide. Yeah, okay. So this is just, uh, and I will talk about, one back, please. So I will talk about the ROAT component, which is which is the first siRNA, which has a positive human data. You can see that it's injected every 12 weeks, and uh, this injection leads to 80% decrease in uh, serum CAAT levels, and roughly the same uh, decreases in the in the hepatic uh, AAT levels. So these are patients who receive biopsy after six or 12 months and uh, 80 to 90% of the, of the AAT is gone, depending on uh, what uh, fraction you are looking into. Next slide. So here you see uh, one uh, more uh, surrogate of this protein retention, and that's uh, called past staining, which is what we use in the clinic to visualize this accumulation. And, and uh, as you can see, uh, the green bars are the ones after the six or 12 month treatment, and you see a massive decrease in, uh, in the accumulation in, or decrease in all patients, in some of them, and a complete resolution. Next slide. So, and this is not only uh, seen in the AAT retention, but it's also seen on the classic biomarkers that we use uh, in the liver clinic, uh, which is ALT or gamma GT. All of them decreased uh, dramatically during the course of the treatment. And you see it also in surrogate markers for liver fibrosis, like the transient elastography or process three uh, serum levels both of them decrease as well. Next slide. So uh, there are even encouraging data on liver fibrosis, which is actually the, the hardest outcome uh, to meet in all liver studies. In this still very small study, there were six out of nine patients uh, who showed an improvement in liver fibrosis. Next slide. So, and uh, currently there are basically two different trials using, uh, taking advantage of this, uh, of this uh, siRNA component. Uh, and uh, they are called ROAT2002 and 2001. And uh, 2002 is the one you saw the data. This is a open label trial. That means that you don't have a direct comparison uh, with placebo. And the ROAT201 trial, that's the larger trial which are recruited patients worldwide and compares the siRNA to placebo. So for the 2001 trial, uh, we don't have the data yet, 
but the good news is that uh, both cohorts are fully recruited and then there is another company coming in uh, with an SIRNA approach so there is yeah, a lot going on on this uh, in this area next slide So uh, in addition to the approach where we try to block the production in general, which will likely not help the, uh, help the lung, there is a, uh, another approach which tries to actually repair the misfolding and kind of get, get the alpha one into the circulation. This is now uh, pursued by two different companies. The one which did some studies on it is called uh, Vaptex, and the other one which is now actually getting, getting into the early clinical trials is Santisa. Next slide. So from the Vaptex, uh, the first basically shot uh, had some issues with elevated liver function tests. The second, uh, second uh, trial using this uh, modulator actually showed that they were able to somewhat increase the AAT serum level. So the approach basically works in principle and is able to, to, kind of, to increase the serum AAT levels a little bit. But the increase, which was about 10 milligram per deciliter, was not uh, deemed sufficient to uh, lead to clinical improvement. And because of that, this trial was discontinued. Next slide. So after many, many years, we have now several companies and two, uh, two first compounds or three compounds are describing clinical trials and uh, there is definitely more to come. And to conclude with Mark Brantley, uh, it was never as exciting to work on these trials as it is now. So uh, we are looking forward to keeping the momentum. Thanks. Okay. It seems like we have about 10 minutes for question and answer. So if you have a question, please put it into the public chat and I will ask it of our presenters. So the first one that came in is if Kamada inhaled outcomes are excellent, when will the alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency patients and population be able to use it daily at home? Well, <clears throat> I, I, that's, that's a great question. And there, the, the, they will move into phase three studies. And so the wind is still unclear. And the, one of the most important things in the phase three studies is they have to be show clinical benefit. And currently almost all of the companies that are developing lung developed therapies right now are struggling with the regulatory agencies to have an adequate outcome variable. Uh, and, uh, and so that the question, that barrier has to be basically clear before we're going to have drugs for alpha trypsin, inhaled alpha trypsin. Okay. So it takes a long time to get therapies approved. Why does it take so long? I'll start that. Pavel can, can finish it. Um, if one of, you know, obviously we'd like new therapies, but obviously the most important thing as we've learned from some of the studies with thalidomide and other things is they have to be safe as well from that standpoint. So a great deal of care is used in exposing first animals and then patients to lower amounts of the, of, uh, of the ther potentially therapeutic drug and then growing that uh, number of individuals over a period of time, that in itself takes quite a bit of time to be able to go through from that standpoint, because you have to give the drug weight and really sometimes quite a long time to make sure that this doesn't have any toxicities. And then finally, you have to validate that, that it has some important clinical effects. Um, clinical trials uh, oftentimes are slowed down by something that's very important. And one of the reasons why I mentioned about alpha one individuals wanting to participate. When you have a clinical trial, um, if it doesn't enroll quickly, that just extends the time that the trial has to be done from that standpoint. And so um, the, the faster you can enroll a trial, the sooner that they can collect all the data and submit it to the regulatory agencies uh, to, for approval from that standpoint. Okay. 
Um, do all trials require placebos? Pavel, you want to go for that one for first? And well, this is this is kind of a uh, a classical thing in medicine. So so in mo in really where in most cases. Uh, the placebo is required. And then the second thing, which actually uh, Mark mentioned a little bit is, uh, it depends a lot how hard you make an endpoint. So, so you have to keep in mind that, uh, that alpha one is a relatively slowly progressive disease. So if you have a endpoint, which really tries to kind of show that this slow disease progression is hal halted, then of course this takes potential years to, to really show because otherwise the delta is very small. So I think if we really want to get uh, our therapies quickly out, then uh, we need to actually reach some premium for the fact that we are working on a rare disease and make the endpoints and make the bar a little bit lower. So I think that's, this is a key issue. Yeah, so the placebo issue is a really sticky one, and it's obviously one the purest studies are double bind placebo controlled studies. But I think that um, we are moving into a new era of study design. They're called adaptive study de designs from that standpoint. And we're hoping that we'll be able to do other things. So the original uh, Alphony trips in the first one described, uh, which was Prolastin, was actually done demonstrating biochemical efficacy and the number and a number of pio, um, plasma products that were came out after that were done uh, as non inferiority so they didn't have to they could they could compare against an existing therapy unfortunately the regulatory agencies do not feel that iv alpha and trypsin therapy is a robust therapy so normally if we had a novel therapy we could compare it to iv alpha and trypsin but the regulatory agencies are not supporting that particular belief at the present time. But there are a number of different ways in which we could eliminate uh, placebo or decrease it substantially. And I think that the manufacturers uh, uh, are discussing with the agency more clever designs that might be used uh, instead of just pure placebo for a long period of time. Okay, great. I have a question. Um to Dr. Shrenad. So if you if you silence down the production of the ZZ molecule, why um, does the quantity of the polymers diminish? Are they uh, dissolved or desoluted? Well, you don't you don't produce basically anything. So you don't produce monomers. And this, since you don't have monomers, you of course don't have polymers as well, because like you know, if there are, uh, if there is no water coming in, then then uh, then you will not get wet, basically. So that's that's the idea that if you just just stop the flow, then you, you will not get any any species of the of the alpha one. There is a large amount of evidence how how uh, these polymers and monomers are cleared. The monomers are primarily probably clear, cleared by proteasome. Uh, the polymers may need another degradatory process called autophagy. But basically, we know that in every liver, there is a high kind of dynamic flow through of alpha-1 and high degradatory capacity. So if you stop kind of the inflow, then you will, of course, eventually de degrade, uh, degrade these uh, aggregates. Thank you. Could oscillometry be used as an outcome measure rather than the more widely acceptable spirometry? Uh, that, that's a good question. So oscillometry is measures lung function in a more, uh, in a, uh, not requiring uh, as much in the way of patient effort from that standpoint. To date, I don't think there've been any clinical trials using that as a primary outcome variable. Um, so it really have to be validated as an outcome variable for that. that We've used oscillometry for years and years and years to, to estimate lung function. And so it'd be nice to be able to put that in. I'm not sure that oscillometry has any, um, is any more accurate. So one of the things when we talk about studies and using outcome variables, the more precise the, the study is and the less variability is, the less subjects have to be in the study. Uh, and so, 
we really look for very precise that uh, uh, measurements that don't vary, uh, you know, by day to day from that standpoint. Okay, there's a question. Um, I'm going to go ahead and read it. I've had great results in liver reduction, steady weight loss using FDA approved extra strength omega-3 lipids called the SCAPA with a prescription. Why not uh, try therapeutical methods? therapeutic methods in clinical trials using non-medical products? Well, you can try whatever you want, uh, want as long as somebody is paying for that, if you, if you put it completely simply, uh, because a clinical uh, study costs, some, like a medium-sized clinical study costs maybe somewhere uh, around $50 million. Uh, uh, so uh, obviously, Obviously, this there has to be a sponsor to to pay for this. That's one thing, and another thing uh, which I would like to comment on this one. Obviously, an an kind of our weight loss is is beneficial in liver disease, and that's that's very well known. And there are many ways, especially if you have steatosis and what's called non-alcoholic fatty liver. So, so this is very well known and shown by multiple studies. So if there is an alpha-1 patient who is overweight and losing weight by any means, you know, by doing more sports, um, by, by uh, uh, changing the diet to a, to a healthier food, uh, there are many ways and they are very well proven to, to work. So I would kind of put it into this category. Okay, and um, we have about one more minute. So I have one more question, which is, when do you see gene therapy as a solution? That's a tough question. So um, I'm the gene therapist in this, this discussion. I've been doing gene therapy since 1986. And uh, I, I think that um, gene therapy still makes a great deal of sense to do. There are many challenges with gene therapy. Uh, and, and I want to also think, say that uh, gene therapy has much broader than it was back when I first started off in 1986 doing gene therapy. Um, gene therapy now basically means all sorts of corrective therapies like ADAR, CRISPR, and a number of other things. The classic concept of gene therapy was, um, was basically taking a normal gene and inserting it into cells, uh, typically using viral vectors from that standpoint. Um, a lot of that hasn't moved as fast as we'd like because we've encountered some real challenges from that uh, in using the different viral vectors. One of the, the differences you can compare between hemophilia and alpha-1 atrypsin deficiency is in hemophilia, um, uh, quite frankly, you only need to correct a very small amount of the defect to basically protect people from bleeding. That amount is probably 5 to 10%. Whereas an alpha neotrypsin is a natural anti-inflammatory molecule that has to bathe the whole body and requires quite a bit. The amounts of alpha neotrypsin that are normal in, in our body are about 1.5 grams. And so to bring it up to that high by any kind of artificial therapy is extremely challenging from that standpoint. It'll happen though. And maybe not viral gene therapy, but some of the other corrective therapies like CRISPR or ADAR or a number of others that might be that might uh, be uh, possible from that standpoint. 